Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to welcome all of our, our viewers to our Black History Month program titled Past, Present and Future Collective Works or Collective Work and Responsibility. Before we start our program, though, I want to just um, have us watch a short video about what Helping Hand for Relief and Development is doing for our brothers and sisters in Turkey. And we pray that Allah uh, makes their situation better. And we pray that we're all able to do something to help alleviate their pain. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Couple of weeks back, Turkey and Syria witnessed one of the biggest calamities of this century. As of today, the official numbers suggest that more than 42,000 individuals have lost their lives. Millions are either displaced from their homes or are injured. In these difficult times, American Muslim community have come together to help support our brothers and sisters, both in Turkey and Syria. Your charity organization, Helping Hand USA, were among the first one to reach and help those brothers and sisters who were in need. Initially, Helping Hand and ICNA pledged to support with a dollar amount of five million to help support the rescue work. But after being there and looking at the situation and the enormity of the problems they are facing, we have increased our pledge from 5 million to 10 million. So I'll request all the membership of ICNA and American Muslim community to come together, help us raise this fund so that we can help our brothers and sisters in Turkey and Syria, the nation and the leadership, which have always stood up to help the Ummah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whenever we needed them. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So again, I want to welcome everyone to our program, Black History Month uh, program, Past, Present and Future, Collective Work and Responsibilities. Inshallah, we will go ahead and begin. And our first speaker is Dr. Jihad uh, Safir. And before he speaks, I want to just um, provide you a short bio of him. So Dr. Jihad is the former chaplain of the California Institute for Women and the former Imam of Masjid At-Taqwa in al Tadina, California. He is currently the director of Islah Campus located in South Central Los Angeles. Um, he's, he's directing several projects, including Islah LA, Islah LA uh, Academy, and is the resident Imam. Dr. Jihad earned a BA in Arabic study in Arabic studies, a master's in Islamic leadership, and a PhD in Islamic um, or practical theology at Claremont School of Theology. He is the founder of Islah LA, which is a nonprofit organization that provides social services to the surrounding communities of Los Angeles. Islah LA's inner city community center is the first of its kind, and through Imam Jihad's leadership, Islah LA has spawned a new wave of civic engagement within the Muslim American community. In 2018, Imam Jihad was awarded with the prestigious KCET Local Heroes Award and has been on Larry King's show, among other appearances. Imam Jihad finds support for his effort from his community, his wife, daughter, and father. And with no further delay, we ask um, Dr. Jihad to um, speak. Audubillahi min al shaytan al rajim, bismillahi al rahman al rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala khayru al mursaleen, Muhammadin wa ala alihi, wa sahbihi ajma'een, amma ba'ad. Rabbish rahli sadri wa yasirli amri wa hlul ugdatam al lisani. Yafqahu qawli. Assalamu alaikum 
wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's a pleasure to be before you all speaking on this particular topic. We open up by mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ayat in the Quran, wa sabiqoon as sabiqoon. And those foremost will be foremost. You know, we think about uh, this term sabiqoon, the foremost, the first to do it, the first to enact a behavior will be the first to receive reward attached to that behavior. So we have the first, for example, uh, to fight in the Battle of Badr. They were honored in the Muslim uh, community uh, amongst the first to uh, perform the uh, migration. They were honored amongst the Muslim community. Uh, it's important that we honor um, the, the, the people who were the first to practice to uh, make sure that faith is manifested in regards to the Muslim faith, um, being Muslim right here in these United States of America. It's important for us to know that Muslims were here before uh, Columbus. You know, um, while in Haiti, for example, uh, then known, Haiti was then known as Española, the uh, native people told Columbus that Americans, they were trading with black people in regards to gold spears. And Columbus found out that these spears were used in Guinea. They were used in part of West Africa. Uh, you also have uh, where this documented the black settlements that were in uh, Brazil. Also documented Mansa, Mansa Abu Bakri, the brother of Mansa Musa, Abu Bakri II of the great Mali empire, he reached uh, the Americas in, in the 14th century before uh, Columbus. So we have in the 17th century, the beginning of this very vicious but uh, profitable industry in chattel uh, slavery. So more than 10 million Africans brought to the Americans. And some say that upward 30% of these, uh, this group were Muslims, right? And what we have to understand, first of all, is that Africans themselves considered Islam as an African religion. Uh, Islam was well established in Africa. So we have the Andalusian uh, historian El Bakri. He describes Ghana in the 11th century. He says they had 12 masajid, 12 mosques in the 11th century. Uh, salaried imams and uh, muedins. Um, they had fuqaha, they had qualified jurists and ulama, they had their own scholars. Uh, you have Ibn Battuta, he described Mali in West Africa in the 14th century. Uh, when he visited, Islam had already been well established in that land, right, uh, for 300 years already. And so he admired many of the Islamic customs of that land. He observed uh, their practices. Um, we see his, uh, him uh, documented, documenting his feelings in regards to them being keen uh, in regards to their prayer. Uh, he admired uh, a lot of admiration for them attending, attending the Friday uh, Jumu'ah, right? Uh, Salatul Jumu'ah. And they, they would wear all white. And he admired that their children uh, were keen in regards to memorizing uh, the, the Quran. They took a lot of pride in the Quran and memorizing the Quran. So you have those who were enslaved, enslaved Africans coming from lands in which Islam was firmly planted and well established, right? So some of these individuals were um, from very scholarly class of Muslims being brought over here. So you have individuals such as Ayyub, Suleiman Jalo or Job bin Solomon. He was enslaved in 1730. He was from uh, synagogue uh, as a child again, which was the custom. He had memorized Quran, studied the traditional uh, Arabic texts, right? On the plantation, it's uh, recorded that he maintained his prayers. He slaughtered his own meat and he avoided the consumption of, of pork. Um, a very hostile environment, but still maintaining his deen. You know, we look at their example that the 
the uh, environments and the turmoil that they had to have endurance and resilience in, in regards to their deen, this istiqama that they had in regards to maintaining their, their prayers on the, the plantation. Um, we look at in one instant, he was harassed while he was trying to pray. So while uh, praying, he was harassed by a young racist white male who mocked, mocked him and threw dirt on him. So this reminds me of uh, uh, the story of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being harassed by uh, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, uh, who uh, threw camel entrails on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, while he was uh, praying. Um, he was able to later escape. Um, one of the well-documented stories that mentions uh, Ayyub, uh, he wrote three copies of the Quran with his hands from uh, memory, right? And his story is known because he wrote um, his father uh, in the Arabic language, right? He wrote a letter um, uh, to his father in the Arabic uh, language. And we have individuals such as uh, Abdurrahman Ibrahim, right? He was born in uh, 1762. And when he was enslaved, he was enslaved in his 20s. Now I want you all to imagine like being uprooted, um, pretty much kidnapped, brought into a new land and your status and your class change overnight. In one land, you are known uh, for your scholarly pursuits. And then now you come in, into the world of uh, chattel slavery where you're demeaned and treated like an animal, right? Uh, so he's enslaved in his, his 20s. He was from a royalty. Um, his purchasers, they nicknamed him Prince because of his royal uh, background. And he too, he wrote a letter of freedom in the Arabic language. His freedom letter was in the Arabic language, right? And the letter went to the U.S. Council in Morocco and finally got the support of from the president, president, president John Quincy Adams for his uh you know, release. So we see right here the Quran and the Arabic language being utilized for freedom. And for uh, Black Americans, especially, Islam is continue, continuously uh, freeing individuals here in regards to placing them in, in, in a position where they are now directed towards purifying their soul. And there's no better type of freedom than being free to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have these individuals, Omar ibn Said, so on and so forth. His story is well uh, documented. He wrote his autobiography in uh, the Arabic language in 1831, uh, and he talks about his life. We have Bilali Muhammad, who his writing of Ar Risala, which is a, a text on Maliki fiqh by Ibn Abi Zaid. Uh, it's being preserved at the University of uh, of Georgia. So we can say that he is perhaps one of the first to you utilize fiqh right here uh, in America. So for the most part, we see that and we have to appreciate this struggle that's taking place. These enslaved African Muslims having to sneak and read their Quran having underground Quran schools, right? Um, having to smuggle in papers and pens and so on and, so, and writing utensils, so on and so forth, in order to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here, as you can see even behind me and um, perhaps in our homes, we have access to these books because people had to strive and struggle for us to be here and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for us to enjoy and benefit from their struggle. We have to take time and look back into their story. We can't forget about our, our sisters on the plantation. Uh, we have Ed Thorpe, an 83-year-old former slave. He recalled his grandmother, his grandmother's name, Patience Spaulding, praying on the plantation, all right? Her name, Patience, having to have sabr on the plantation, right? She's known for praying on the plantation. We have another, Rachel Anderson. She remembered her grandmother, Peggy, praying every day at sunrise, noon, and sunset, 
her mother evidently a uh, Muslim. Rosa Grant recalled, uh, recalled her grandmother, Rhina, praying on the plantation, right? So this attaches us to our, our prayers, right? This attaches us to bowing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when people had to go through um, even having secret prayer, when people had to hide their identity as Muslim, we should be appreciative for the striving and the struggling, the turmoil, the the ibtila, right? That they went through, right? The trials that they went through, we should be more appreciative and it should, it should glue us to our prayer rug and bowing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It should solidify our relationship with the Quran, we're being reminded of what, what people had to go through for us to get uh, here. So we have after slavery where Islam played such a huge role because you have during slavery, then Jim Crow, you had lynchings, right? We have uh, so much we can talk about. We, we have Jim Crow separate facilities where black people had to go to separate restaurants, separate stores, separate schools, right? And you have uh, uh, well-financed white, white facilities where black people had no access to unless they were entertainers for uh, white people. We can't forget about the different individuals. Um, for example, James Lomax Bay, he was the chief lieutenant of Noble Drew Ali, right? So in 1913, a decade after, uh, um, and you know we don't have time to go into this particular individual, uh, but 1913, Noble Drew Ali uh, became the founder of the first black Islamic sect in America. And I mentioned these because we may be thrown off and say, hey, these groups are not a part of the Sunnah, so on and so forth. They don't recognize the Quran. But many of the Muslims had to go through the more science temple of America to enter into the Sunnah. They had to go through these fringe movements in order to enter into uh, the Sunnah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we plan in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans and Allah is always the best of planners. So you have James Lomax Bay, he went through the nation or he went through the, um, the more science temple of America. He was the lieutenant, chief lieutenant of Noble Drew Ali. He ended up traveling to Turkey to study Islam and then he ended up in Egypt and he became Muhammad Izzeldin. Right? He came back to America, they purchased 300 acres of land in New York and they established sort of like an African American Muslim town, right? They established what they call Izzeldin Village, where you have Muslim families coming together building community with one another. So we learn how to build community from these beautiful figures. You have Khalid uh, Ahmed Tawfiq. He was also, he founded the Islamic Brotherhood in Harlem in 1964, right? He was also, he went through the Moor Science Temple, but he ended up at Al Azhar through Malcolm X. Malcolm X helped him get uh, into where he can study at Al Azhar in uh, Egypt. Right, and he joined. He was with Malcolm X at seventeen. He joined the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Um, you have the Nation of Islam. Alhamdulillah, my father came through that particular uh, door, and I'm grateful that my father, he Imam Sadiq Safir, who Alhamdulillah he became one of the the foremost leaders in South Los Angeles, uh, founding Masjid Ibadullah, which now Alhamdulillah we have transitioned into. Uh, Isla LA and Isla Academy, but they, my fathers, my uncles, my aunties, they put in work for us to be here uh, in the nation of Islam. You're talking about from 1934 to 1975, uh, worth an estimated $85 uh, million at its peak, having farmlands, having gas stations, uh, restaurants, uh, bakeries, uh, so on and so forth newspapers they had their own uh bank alhamdulillah so in 1975 they transitioned into the sunnah so the nation of islam taken over by imam wardi muhammad who had the courage 
to step up and introduce people to figures such as Bilal bin Rabah, you know, telling us and uh, uh, introducing us to a figure that we can relate to. Uh, Bilal bin Rabah going through the struggle of uh, being enslaved and so on and so forth and being able to rise up as a Muslim, such a beautiful figure for us, alhamdulillah. And we have so many figures that we have in America. I didn't know justice in this talk, but what I'm saying is that we have to uh, we have to really respect those who came before us, the Sabiqun. They did it so we can continue the work that we are doing today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have utmost mercy on the Sabiqun, on the people who established Islam in America so our sisters can walk around freely with their hijabs, so the brothers can walk around looking like Muslims uh, with their kufis and the Quran. I mean, in the, we're in the inner city, so we have utmost respect from our neighbors, and that's because of the work that our uncles and aunties put in before we were even born. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them. I thank you all for giving me an opportunity to share. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you all uh, with the beautiful rest of the evening or the rest of the day and um, continue to do your research about those who were the first to establish this deen right here in these United States of America. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jihad. An uh, excellent presentation on the past. And I would like to briefly talk about uh, the present before we move on to Sister Bilqis, who will talk about the future. What I want to begin with is saying, when talking about the present, is that the past is not that far away. And many of the challenges that African-Americans faced in the past are still, we're facing them today. And they're still prominent challenges, such as the wealth gap, such as inequities in, in education, police br brutality. And if you listen to some of the talks from the 60s and the 70s, you would think in 80s, you would think that they're talking in 2023 or 2022, seriously, subhanAllah. So alhamdulillah, there was a, a lot of progress been made and a lot of progress has been um, made, but there is a long way to go. And as Dr. Jihad said, uh, alhamdulillah, the Muslims were in the forefront with making that change. So with establishing, establishing this first point that the past is not that far away, I want to ask a question that I've asked many audiences. And that is, when do you think the last child of an enslaved person died here in America? And I think this will help us see how recent these challenges were. So again, when did when did the last child of an enslaved person die? So this person, either his mother or his father was a slave. Many people would say, or many people responded by saying, oh, maybe sometime in the 60s. Some said the 70s, some said the 50s, some said maybe 2008, I mean, excuse me, in 1980. Uh, 80s, because that shows you how close it is, if it's the 1980s and what have you. However, the answer is last year. Last year, and I'm not lying or joking or exaggerating, it is believed that the very last person to be a descendant of a slave died. There may be others. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was the lady who rang, rang the bell um, during the inauguration of the National Museum of African-American History and Culture with Barack Obama, she was a daughter of 
a slave. And I'm not saying granddaughter or great granddaughter, but the daughter, Ruth Boner. So uh, you can look this up. Uh, Daniel Smith, who died less than six months ago, um, I believe it was November 17th. Um, his father was born just a few years before the Emancipation Proclamation. So he lived in slavery. And at the age of 70, he had a child named Daniel Smith, who, like I said, died not too long ago. So with that frame of mind, with you thinking, hopefully now you understand that this past is not far removed. You know, even though we may say we appreciate the progress that we have made and we some people say we're in post post racial racial America. I, I, I would uh, dispute that, obviously. But um, this, again, just stresses the importance that a lot of work has to be done. And as a matter of fact, as I mentioned, a lot of the prominent issues in during the civil rights struggle, which afforded so many people rights, uh, those issues are prominent. And let me pause here to say also what is very interesting and perhaps slightly politically incorrect is that I believe a lot of the struggles and many are of the opinion that a lot of the struggles that happened in the past by African-Americans, meaning the struggles that they um, went through to establish, you know, this respect for diversity and equal rights and civil rights and what have you, I would say that a lot more other communities are benefiting from their efforts more than they are themselves. You'll find when you look at the metrics of success that African-Americans for the most part are on the bottom of almost every metric of success. So something has to be wrong. So in the presence, there is this awakening. There's this beginning of consciousness that something is wrong because how can someone, for example, migrate from almost anywhere from the world and can establish themselves in America quicker than um, African-Americans who have been in that city or that area for literally generations or centuries. So I think this is why you, you see this uh, awakening or this um, awareness that something is wrong. Our issues today still exist, but there are just more discreet. And like Dr. Jihad said, I we really don't have much time to explain these different things uh, or the details within a short period of time. But all I want to do is cure, is, is, um, is make you curious. Uh, I want you to learn more, as he mentioned, and think more and question more. And if you do that, I think this will be great. As they say, if you know better, do better. So that's really the crux of really what I want to say today is that Muslims do have a responsibility to help and fight against injustice. And even if this injustice is not against them per se, but against another group. And as many have said, um, injustice anywhere, like Dr. Martin Luther King, um, threatens justice everywhere. It's a threat everywhere, uh, injustice. It's, and so I encourage us not to be silent. And, uh, you, I, I think I mentioned last time that some said, you know, we were silent when stop and frisk used to take place in New York where uh, they randomly selected uh, African-Americans and uh, Latinos and others. And then this was only the forerunner to the Muslim ban. And again, you see how you have these issues, but they're more discreet now. But I'm saying we should not be silent. And I heard many people say that I thought civil rights and these issues didn't really affect me. I thought it was good, but it wasn't an issue that I need to pay close attention to. And I would definitely say this is not the case. And again, alhamdulillah, you have people like Malcolm X, you have people like Muhammad Ali, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who were first and forefront in using their platform to fight for equality, to fight for civil rights, and this benefited so uh, many people. And I've heard also, 
and just make maybe one more point after this. Some have told me from our community, meaning the Muslim community, that in reality, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, the status quo benefits us because we come and we're not necessarily on the very bottom. We find African-Americans um, and we can go into their communities and have access to this huge market. And because they are struggling to really uh, be business owners to to and their finances and they're just trying to uh, survive, we can come in and dominate. And so subhanAllah, uh, uh, you know, this person and there are more than one person was telling me that I had to fight against that urge to want to change a situation that I benefit from. Today, it's one group, but tomorrow it may be a different group. And even if it's not a different group, then we should just be, we shouldn't be satisfied with justice and inequities no matter where it may be. So again, I just want to say, if we know better, we should do better. And so, um, is that we educate ourselves and, and spend time on this issue, not just in February, 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 but throughout the the year. And when we do focus on these issues and we do unite, um, you will see great results and great uh, progress. And alhamdulillah, this is where we should strive to be as Muslims. We should make sure that we are adding value to society. And we have so much to give besides the greatest gift being Islam. In terms of education, Muslims are usually uh, more educated than a typical American. We, in terms of finance, we are usually um, more financially stable than the typical American. And we have so many things to give so let us concern ourselves now. And this is a time of opportunity, a time of when people really see that there is something wrong. Many of us can do something about it and make a change, but it takes us caring and knowing. So if you know better, do better. Jazakumullah uh, khairan. With that, uh, I want to move to Sister Bilqis, who will end with our talk on the future. But perhaps um, before reading her bio, I wanted to, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Jossie McKenzie, and I'm the uh, Skills Development and Livelihood Program Director with Helping Hand. So moving on to our next speaker, Sister Bilqis Abdelqad. She is a trailblazer in the world of Islamic education and women's rights. She is the first Muslim woman to play NCAA Division I basketball while wearing a hijab, making her an inspiration to people of all ages. Bilqis has spoken and shared her personal story on national stages, such as at the White House and the United Nations, also featured in multiple publications and broadcasted on TV shows. After record-breaking performances, her dream to play professionally quickly ended due to the International Basketball Federation. FIBA. The FIBA rule prohibiting headgear and larger than uh, that that was larger than five inches. Due to that, her uh, dream came to an end. But unwilling to stray in her her belief, Bilqis chose faith over basketball. And through op-eds, speaking engagements, and interviews nationally and internationally, Bilqis raised her voice for the next generation while her own dream was benched. And in 2017, May 2017, FIBA, this uh, International Basketball Federation, which makes the rules for uh, that govern basketball, they overturned the hijab ban, the, excuse me, the hijab ban. So with no other uh, delay, uh, I'll ask Sister Bilqis to uh, address us. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, Brother Jassi, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, Dr. Jihad, 
I learned so much, mashallah, in 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and so it's always, when we can talk about black history and the work that you know we've done, um, it's always a good day, mashallah. Uh, so really quickly, I was born and raised in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, many people don't know that that is the birthplace of basketball. That's a fun fact, so carry that with you. I literally grew up about three miles away from where um, James Naismith put a ball in a peach basket. And so in that city, especially in the inner city, you know, which I lived in the inner city, um, the majority of the youth were black. And uh, the sport that we all played all in our neighborhoods was basketball. Um, mashallah, I'm the youngest of eight. I have four sisters, three brothers. My parents both reverted to Islam, alhamdulillah. And uh, we were considered a basketball family in Springfield. Um, so as a homeschool child, uh, my mother, mashallah, had the courage and the strength to keep us all home. Again, the youngest of eight. She kept us all home, schooled us because she didn't trust uh, the public school system where I was from, um, of course, low income schools. Um, and it was just, you know, it was a, it, it was a rough situation to be in. So she said, you know what, I'm keeping them home and I'm going to give them the best that I could. And of course she gave us Islam. And so I started playing basketball around age three. Uh, of course it became a hobby. Uh, I love to watch my brothers play. I tried to do everything they did outside of, you know, outside in our backyard and mashallah, Allah blessed me with this raw talent to play. But things changed at the age of 12. Uh, my parents let me know that we couldn't afford college. And um, that was our situation. So, of course, I'm 12. I'm thinking, what are we poor? You know, what is this? Um, and uh, I hate to say it, but a lot of the families in our communities were in the same position. So I knew that I had to get a scholarship. I knew it. Every day in my homeschool day, I was outside grinding, trying to be the best basketball player I could be so I could get this scholarship. I knew that I had an opportunity. If I was good, I could get a full ride to, to a college. So alhamdulillah, made it through uh, high school. I broke some records, mashallah. I get this Division I uh, scholarship. I ended up becoming the first hijabi to play Division I basketball. And it was amazing. You know, I was a little famous. Um, I, you know, loved every bit of it. And I was, I was doing what I loved, free ride, made my parents proud, mashallah, right? Finally, I get to the level of uh, pro and I can't play. And what Brother Jassy mentioned, FIBA, which is everybody knows FIFA, but FIBA is the basketball version of, of uh, FIFA. And they said that I could hurt somebody with my hijab. And when my agent and I, who was helping me, you know, get a professional contract, we're looking at this rule and we're like, well, I could hurt somebody. This doesn't make any sense. Then they come back with, you know, we want to keep the game religiously neutral. So we knew immediately this has to be some type of discrimination. Right. So at that time in my life, when you graduate from college, you have about three months before you sign a rookie contract. So I'm like, it's no problem. You know, tell them, tell them that I'm Muslim. I've been wearing my hijab all of this time, four years in, in college. It should be no problem, right? FIBA stopped responding to us. So now I'm stuck. You know, my plan A was to be a professional basketball player. I had dreamt about this day my entire life, subhanAllah. As soon as I get there and, I, and, it, and it's tangible and I'm getting ready to just, you know, sign this contract and make money. I was told I couldn't play because of what I looked like, what I believed in. And at that point, <clears throat> I realized that it was past sport. It was past basketball. It was deeper than that. And that's when I realized that I call it a trifecta. But being a black Muslim woman was an issue. And then add athlete to it. It was unknown. Nobody had ever seen really a hijabi play a sport. You know, I would walk into stands and stadiums. I'm sorry, I would walk into stadiums and people would literally make fun of me. You know, what is she wearing? Laughing, making jokes, all these things. But SubhanAllah, as soon as I crossed somebody over, made a three-point shot, those same people that were making fun would look at me and be like, what? She, the girl with the clothes can play? Who is this? SubhanAllah, it would change their minds because that's how universal sport is, right? But at that moment when I found that I couldn't play, I started to question Islam. Um, 
I was so broken and, and so torn that I was weighing things out. Man, should I just take, take off my hijab to play? Should I, should, I, I need this. Like this is, this is my career. I worked so hard for this. Why would Allah take it away? Questioning everything about Islam. But in those moments, it wasn't about me. It was about my mother. And of course my father, but my mother, right? It was about the foundation that she laid for me, just like Dr. Jihad mentioned. I was gonna give up everything that, that she came with. You know, my mother converted to Islam in 1970. She was one of two Muslims. And the other person was her sister who converted to Islam in Springfield, Massachusetts. And you know what they had to study? She just recently shared this with me. They had, they had a sheet, one sheet of paper that wasn't even full of the five pillars, the seven articles of faith, basics. SubhanAllah, my mother would probably be upset that I shared this, but when she first started to wear her khimar, she didn't know that she had to cover her arms and everything. So she had her hijab on maybe with a short sleeve shirt and some in a dress. Like who knows? She didn't know. And so when I was faced with this decision of Islam versus the dunya, let's say, a career in basketball, making money, yeah, we all love it. You know, it's, it would have been a great life. I thought about the work my parents laid down for our family. That my mother literally became Muslim during a time where there were really no other Muslims in the community. You know, my father later met my mother again in life because they knew each other. He becomes Muslim after living a life full of what we, our young people see, you know, on TV, TikTok, social media, the parties, the this. You know, they stopped all of that and chose Islam. And then to be like a... basketball, I knew that I had to take a stand for the girls who looked like me, who were going to come after me. Because at one point I was like, forget it. I can't play. Forget about everything else. I'll figure something out. But then when I gave my first speaking engagement to a Sunday school of young Muslim girls, girls who were black, of course, the Desi community, out of every single Muslim girl was looking up at me saying, I want to be like you. I said, okay, Allah, I get it. I totally get it. And so what I can say today and the work that actually my husband and I both do, we're athletic directors. We actually work at a, at a masjid here in Memphis, Tennessee, and we run a sports program. But it's bigger than that. You know why it's bigger than that? Because when we step out on these playing fields, a black Muslim woman, a black Muslim man, married, mashallah, we're bringing the community together. We're bridging so many gaps because sport is so universal, subhanAllah. We, we all saw it. The entire world saw it in Doha, right? The fact that Allah blessed us with this, this talent <clears throat> to run these programs, to, to share our experiences with kids from every walk of life in our community. It's a blessing that we can bridge those gaps. And when I tell you it's not, when you see our programs, you see a mix of kids. And you know, a lot of our, our communities are sometimes there's gaps. We have the black masjid, we have the Arab masjid, we have the Desi masjid, we have, subhanAllah, what our goal is with our programs here is to stop that. And to, and, and to be here today um, and using what I've gone through and what my mother had gone through, what my father had gone through to say my mother and father gave me Islam and I'm using the, the, the talent that Allah blessed me with to break stereotypes, to teach people about Islam, just walking on a basketball court. People see me, they're like, what is this sister, right? And then to show the world that a black Muslim woman can, can, period. It's, it's a true blessing. And um, what I have to give to our communities, you know, some advice that I would give Number one is like Dr. Jihad said and Brother Jassi said, if you know better, you do better. Educate ourselves. But the way to, to connect to our youth now 
isn't just sitting them down and lecturing them. We have to be active. You know, when I grew up, I used to see my mother, and I'm saying physically active, right? I used to see my Umi in pictures of her playing basketball while we were all doing picnics and I would see my mother race us. You know, I would see her bring us to these basketball games, cheer us on in the crowd. It's, it's so important to be active with our, with our youth. Um, bring them something that we can connect with. And right now what we can do, my husband and I is sport. And, you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm very grateful to be in this position um, and to even be a part of Black history. SubhanAllah, I, I never would have thought I'd be speaking on panels um, such as these. And so it's just true. It's a true blessing. Um, but let's educate ourselves and let's give our youth something that they can connect to and connect back to Islam. Um, and that's all I really have to say. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. This was, um, mashallah, fantastic uh, um, program. And I really appreciate you, Sister Bilkis, sharing that story with us. And I've um, heard your story many times, but it, every time I hear it, it really touches me. And obviously, for those... Uh, no, I'm from Memphis. So, and Sister Bilkis played for the University of Memphis. So, I always had, you know, a lot of admiration. And then she marries a, a close friend of mine in Memphis. So, uh, mashallah, uh, I am uh, very happy to, that you um, added tremendous amount of value to this program. And I ask Allah to accept all our efforts and to truly allow us to benefit from programs like this. And I thank our audience for attending. And again, um, I think you heard the message over and over again that this is a, a topic that I think we should um, pay more attention to, you know, the efforts that others have, have given. These stories of the past are, um, are good, and they would tell us how to get to the future, such as Sister Bilkis, she went through her struggle, but now the rules have changed thanks to her sacrifice. And this is what we... Um, are saying today that we should truly be grateful by knowing the efforts that those who um, came before us put in. And in that case, we'll pass it on. We'll give back, inshallah, if we are truly grateful. Jazakumullah khayr, and we'll close with that. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu in la ilaha illa ant astaghfirhu wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.